Since the dawn of time, or at least the time since men have lived in the suburbs, they have felt, largely due to commercials formatted like this, that they are not man enough. That's why they lease a Ford F-250 and go camping exactly one time before subconsciously deciding it's not worth the effort. But for that one night in their REI sleeping bag, I'll be damned if they don't feel like Burt Reynolds. And that's exactly what Burt Reynolds does as Lewis Medlock in James Dickey's Deliverance. Hey gang, I'm Jordan David, and if you're new here, trust me, we're both surprised. The 1972 movie Deliverance was a breakout blockbuster hit for new star Burt Reynolds who would go on to become Smokey and the Bandit. And it is adapted from this book here, which I read first, and it is so engrossing that I finished it in less than three days. It's written by James Dickey, the 18th Poet Laureate of the United States, and this was his one-hit wonder of a novel. In short, Deliverance is about four suburban dads who take to a river rafting trip that ends in death, multiple near deaths, and plenty of injuries. Their inclination for the trip was the prodding of Lewis Medlock, or Burt Reynolds, who is a kind of Joe Rogan-y type who's obsessed with archery and obsessed with depriving himself of the common comforts of humanity because he's discontent with the suburban lifestyle. Oh, he's also a doomsday prepper. He wants to go down this strip of river with rapids so intense that it's not even charted on maps because it was too dangerous for men to travel down. So it's kind of an uncharted river in the United States, but the section of the river that it is on is going to be flooded by the state and become a lake, and then they're going to build a resort around it. And Lewis wants to get there and explore it before it's all underwater for the appreciation of nature and the challenge of doing something for its own sake. His best friend, the narrator and protagonist, Ed Gentry, is convinced uh, begrudgingly by Lewis to embark on this endeavor with him, and they are going to raft down it with two of their bar buddies, Frank and Drew. And what you have here are four different archetypes of the suburban dad. You've got Joe Rogany type, Lewis Medlock. You've got Ed Gentry, who is an art director, and has a new baby, and he's very content with his lifestyle. He doesn't grumble much. He, he, he wants to just be happy with what he has, but he is very introspective. You have the very naive Drew, who loves nothing more than to play a simple tune for his friends in the forest. And you have Frank, who is the archetypal, lazy, whiny, spoiled, brat, uh, heavyset, suburban dad who just likes the simple pleasures in life, and he has no business getting in a canoe at all, much less going down an uncharted, rapid-filled river, but they do, and it ends terribly. And I don't feel the need to actually wreck the contents of the story for you, because I think that you should read it. And furthermore, I think that you should watch the movie, and at the very least, just watch the movie and don't read the book. But I do want to analyze the core message of it to you. And that is to say that I want to talk about the dramatic question of this book. I done ripped the cover of this bad boy clean off. All right, so we're doing a little bit of repair. All better. See, every story has a plot, but literary fiction has an extra component to it that separates a John Green novel from a James Patterson novel. You can feel what the character is feeling in both, and you can be entertained by both. But Literary fiction authors bake in answers to questions about morality or survival or human behavior, and it is your job as a reader to figure out not the answer, because they're giving you the answer, it's to figure out the question. And that unstated question that you're trying to find is called the dramatic question, and it's always unstated, but it's always written into the book. So I read this story where four different suburban dads take their lives into their own hands by going on this very treacherous trip, and I have to first ask myself, why is this a story worth telling? These days, there's a lot of talk about the trait of masculinity, and we have a lot of pretext for that now. We have fragile masculinity, we have toxic masculinity, and these words are used to describe behaviors that are shown by movies, that are shown by books, that are shown by Ford commercials, as what makes somebody a real man versus 
uh, what makes somebody a fake man or a soft man. If you have these qualities, you are a manly man, and if you don't have them, you are a soft man. These involve physical machismo, you know, being able to lift heavy things or to grow a mustache, as well as that James Bond quality of being able to solve every problem as it arises, no matter what resources you have at hand, and being clever enough to succeed at any moment, but humble enough to succeed without making it look like you're succeeding. And the reason why anybody, any human, men or women, would want these traits is clear. Because if one possesses the ability to succeed in any situation, then they are separated from their pack of peers, which we all want, whether we do that through domineering or we do it through a self-righteous humility, as Emily Bronte writes in Wuthering Heights. Beyond the need to be special, uh, the person that can solve any problem that comes their way is, in essence, invincible, which we also all want, kind of subconsciously, kind of consciously. Of course, these people don't exist in real life because no human is, or ever has been, invincible. And since the advent of cities, where humans were no longer required to cultivate their own food, physical machismo left the list of necessary human traits as did the need to be clever enough, really, to survive on your own. Because the point of living in society is to eliminate the necessity of these traits, which are difficult to cultivate and impossible to maintain over time. But we reached a point in society, sometime after World War II, in America at least, where a large majority of people in the United States and in Western Europe had all of the basic physiological human needs taken care of. Everybody, or a large majority of people, had access to shelter. A large majority of people had access to food. They had to work for it, it didn't come to them freely, but there wasn't much risk of not seeing a, an animal for four months, like we used to have to worry about 300 years ago. And what this left was a lot more free time for humans to worry about the higher end of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Belonging, which we find in society. Self-actualization, which is to understand the sense of self. And when you're trying to understand your sense of self, you do it largely by comparing yourself to other people. Now, common recommendations today tell you that that's a bad idea, but it's something we all do and we pretend that we don't. And what we saw out of this self-actualization is that goes, what's different between me and Frank? What's different between me and that guy? What can I do that he can't do that makes me my own human being? What makes me distinct? And from that meditation, a lot of people started putting themselves into more difficult living conditions as leisure. General health things that people have certainly been able to live without, happily, but that we added back in because it would be better to strain ourselves than to not to. Going to the gym because we no longer had to lift heavy objects like we did 100 years ago, 200 years ago, before everything was automated and easy for us. Going into the woods with a tent and cutting down a tree and chopping it into firewood and heating it up so that you can stay warm when the house that you left has central heating. And the plan of this is to regain by choice those invincible human qualities that help us self-actualize as different or make us feel a little bit safer, feel a little bit stronger when a majority of people don't need to have these skills. And this is the dream that Lewis Medlock sells to his friends, a deliverance from that boring, from that uninteresting suburban life. But is becoming a superhuman as simple as going on a river rafting trip with your buddies? James Dickey says no. Because when you expose yourself to risk as leisure instead of as necessity, you might not be prepared for when things go wrong. And indeed, these men were not. And that leads to my guess of James Dickey's dramatic question. I think that he wanted to ask, what type of modern human does it take to survive these kind of primitive risks that we all used to face as humans. That's why each character in the story is so distinctly different from one another, even though they all come from a similar background. There's four different types of men being compared, and their performance in the wilderness is measured by their ability to get out of it unscathed. 
And Dickie's answer, there's two types of people who can make it out there. There's the Lewis Medlock type, who, even though they live a cushy suburban life, live believing that anything that can go wrong will go wrong. So they've bought a bomb shelter up in the hills, and they have learned to become a star archer. And then there's the, the Ed Gentry type, who have a touch of natural cleverness, maybe because they're in a creative role in their life, and it kind of translates to the rest of their life. And also, he's got a baby. He's got something other than himself to live for. And using those two things, he might just be able to MacGyver himself out of this harrowing situation that they find themselves in. The naive and the lazy need not even enter the woods because the society that they're running away from exists for a reason, for them. And to that end, Deliverance seems to demonstrate that these masculine traits don't really have a use outside of a foreign environment. And once you're in that environment where these traits might be necessary, the last thing that you're going to be thinking about is whether or not you stack up to the man next to you. You're going to be thinking, I want to go home. I want to get out of here. I don't want to die. It's a thriller. And what makes Deliverance even more interesting are the sub-dramatic questions, such as the difference between the law and morality and the morality of lying. And the fact that it is all set in this beautiful Appalachian wilderness is just icing on the cake. So I highly encourage you to read it, and I highly encourage you to check the movie out as well. Even if you don't come from a background where you would start taking random risks as leisure, because your life really isn't that easy currently, I still think that there's a lot for you to take away from this book, in that you can maybe feel more appreciative of the grounded life that you lead compared to the ungrounded life of Burt Reynolds. Deliverance is consistently included on the top 100 lists for best novels of the 20th century, so definitely give it a try. Check it out. If you want a copy, you can buy it from the link that I leave in the description, or you can go support a local bookstore that's even better. And if you have any thoughts on my take on Deliverance, if you've read it yourself or seen the movie, I look forward to hearing them in the comments below. You know I love engaging with you guys. Like this video if you liked it, and subscribe if you want to see more things like this. And until next time, cheers.